Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for our Lunch a la Carte, the December 2022 edition. We appreciate you being here today. We have a couple of very quick announcements. I want to say a very special thank you to all of our donors who have joined the Roger Ackerman Circle. This is our list of recurring donors. You simply go to mycartfund.org to sign up for that. As you may recall, our goal was 100 donors in the first 100 days, and we have have about uh, 20 some, maybe 19 days left in this year to hit the 100 day mark. And we are as of today at 80 recurring donors. So I thank you for those of you who have signed up to do so. And if you haven't yet, there's still time to do that and help us meet our goal of 100 in the first 100 days. I want to remind you to follow the CART Fund on social media. We are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, and we have an active YouTube channel. And if you will subscribe to our YouTube channel, then you'll be notified when new videos are released and uploaded, including the monthly recordings of this Lunch a la Carte and our monthly meetings of our district chairs and other interested people. I want to remind you also of the new initiative coming after the first of the year, a cause-based Rotary Club that will focus on promoting CART and Alzheimer's research. If you would like more information on that, you are welcome to reach out to me. We'll be happy to share more details with you, and you'll be hearing more about that after the first of the year. Now, today, it is our honor and privilege to introduce our grant recipient, Dr. Susan Keck. She is going to be presenting with us today. She she is a professor and director of the Nomis Center for Immunobiology and Microbial Pathogenesis at the Salk Institute. She did her postdoctoral work at Emory University and received her PhD in developmental biology at Stanford. She received her BS in cellular and molecular biology at the University of Washington. Dr. Keck aims to understand how memory T cells are produced during infection and vaccination, how they function, and why in some particular cases they fail to induce long-term immunity. Her lab has been a leader in using genetic and molecular tools to identify the genes and signaling molecules that are involved in generating two specific types of memory T cells, CD4 and CD8, from precursor cells during both acute and chronic viral infections. Her lab has made several notable discoveries in elucidating how and when memory T cells form following infection or vaccination. Dr. Keck was the recipient of our organization's top award, the Roger Ackerman Memorial Grant in 2021, receiving a $300,000 grant to study infectious history as a determinant of age-related inflammation in Alzheimer's disease. It is my honor and privilege to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Susan Keck. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, and thank you for coming. And of course, thank you for the generous support of the research that has been going on in our lab. And um, I'm very excited to, to tell you more about it. Um, and for those of you who um, were present at the award um, ceremony uh, that we had a couple of years ago, there'll be some of the, some of the information will be be similar to that. But for those of you who are new, I hope it'll be um, It'll be a new and 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 I really look forward to your questions afterwards. Um, uh, I, if I try, I'm going to try to um, not get too deep in the weeds of the immunology and and uh, stay kind of um, at the high a higher level. But of course, I'm sure I could uh, lose people along the way, so I hope I don't do that. Um, what we have been studying as and this and and. The, my in, my introduction into the field of Alzheimer's disease has come as a result of me moving to the Salk Institute. The Salk Institute has phenomenal um, neuroscientists, uh, and we started to think as a group about all the different ways in which uh, aging, being the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's, how what are the processes by which aging um, affects the brain, and how are these kind of common processes are altered with age, perhaps underlying some of the, the uh, elements and, and causes and the changes in the brain that occur uh, that puts one at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. And so this really um, came from our uh, working group uh, at Salk to think about all these other um, parts of just general cellular you know, um, being uh, that could be that we know are altered with age 
that uh, could be underlying. And so of course, how our cells use food and nutrients, how they build their energy, how they make their energy, their metabolism, that is altered with age. But how does that occur in the brain? And what are the specific pathways that are occurring that could be changing that puts the cells at risk for developing Alzheimer's? We know that our genes are, are expressed in very specific ways and that our genomes, the DNA and the way it's wrapped and kind of, you know, buttoned up together is also uh, highly altered with age, but we don't know exactly how this is occurring. And so, so these are the kinds of ideas we had, like, let's look at some of the fundamental cellular processes and see how they change with age. And so inflammation is, of course, one of the um, hallmarks of age, almost all of our tissues as they age develop what we refer to as inflammation. They, they, they start to secrete new products, new proteins at higher levels. And the balance of the types of proteins that they secrete that can create inflammation change with age. And so all of our tissues become inflammatory with age, but we don't understand what is driving that. And that is a fundamental aspect that we need to understand for, for aging um, as to how this is starting to occur. And so I was starting to think about, well, what could be causing inflammation in the brain, in the brain tissue with age and what would be underlying factors. And that's what led to the development of this proposal. Um, and so I think you'll, you'll understand kind of how, how we got there. And, and again, as we know, specifically in Alzheimer's disease, there is chronic inflammation that's associated and, and how, when inflammation is, is kept in check, which it usually is in, in under states of homeostasis, you can, you can maintain tissue health, but as you have chronic inflammation and, and an over exuberance of, of an immune response, then you can, and this can be an immune response to a, to a pathogen, to a foreign pathogen, or it could also be inflammation that's just occurring in what we refer to as a bystander manner. It's just occurring as a result of altered, um, th these, these homeostatic checkpoints have become eroded or lost. And, and we start to, to produce and develop more inflammatory products in our, in our tissues and, and in our circulation. And so that's kind of the, the basis of, of what we're, we we're thinking about is that there's just higher levels of inflammation, this kind of bystander inflammation, perhaps that's contributing to um, the age related changes in the brain that could be underlying risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And so in particular, then what would be the causes of how, how, what would be the causes of factors that could lead to um, this increase in chronic inflammation? What environmental variables could be altering this? Because we know our study of Alzheimer's disease that there is a genetic component, but the majority of people over 96% of the population who develops Alzheimer's disease, they do not have these genetic risk factors. They are developing Alzheimer's disease in what we refer to as a sporadic manner, but we know it's not entirely random and sporadic. There's gotta be underlying variables that contribute to this. And so the variable that we've been thinking about then is inflammation. And what could these variables be? Well, one could be that as a result, what causes this chronic inflammation with age could be the production of, of molecules like type one interferons or these interferons that are actually produced as a result of trying to fight a viral infection but these could be part of the um, age-related inflammatory molecules that are getting increased with age. And so is viral infection then actually a variable, an environmental variable that could be leading to the increase in the uh, inflammatory products that are associated with age? And, and how, if so, how could that be, be contributed uh, to Alzheimer's disease? And so that was really kind of the, the whole idea was to try to ask, you know, going from this tissue homeostasis. And when thinking more specifically about, about the cells in the brain, uh, are, there's many different types of cells in the brain, but there's three primary cell types in the brain. Of course, our, our neurons, which, which is the, the, the business end of the brain. But then we have two supporting cell types, astrocytes and microglia. And, and astrocytes are very critical for supporting synap the synapses of neurons. And microglia also play an important role for pr promoting synapses, but they're also the, the brain resident immune cell. Microglia are actually what we refer to as macrophages. And these are immune cells that are there to maintain tissue health. 
they have an important role in kind of cleaning up that we call them like the housekeepers of the, of the, of the brain, they clean up the brain, but they also then would be important for if there was an infection, they would be important for a host defense for, for antimicrobial response. And, but what we know is that because these microglia are, are immune cells, they can also have a homeostatic state, kind of a resting state in which they're kind of doing their day-to-day -day job in the brain. But if they were to get then activated, if they were to see microbes or a virus, or if they were able to see other types of inflammatory molecules like interferons, they would become activated and primed. And they themselves would then contribute to producing inflammatory mediators. And so we know that, and they, we refer to this as inflammaging, uh, because as tissues age, we see these inflamed states become more common in different cell types within tissues. And in particular, the macrophages in our tissues and in the brain, it would be the microglia become, can, we can see these, this evidence of them becoming more inflamed and, and kind of activated or primed. And then the idea is that if this goes on and develops into then chronic inflammation, if these, these inflamed states, these prime states progress, that these cells will then develop and produce um, higher levels, even higher levels of inflammatory products that can lead to chronic inflammation that then can have be detrimental and lead to the erosion of synapses and to the death of neurons. And this is kind of the idea behind long-term chronic inflammation, neuroinflammation, that can then lead to the uh, altered function of the neurons, their death, and then um, help progress uh, neuro neurodegenerative states in the brain. And so this is the paradigm by which we're kind of thinking about this. So how does this kind of inflammatory state then, then emerge? Um, and how do, how do we go from these states of prime microglia to this more detrimental inflamed state? And, and if we understood what causes these triggers and these changes with age, you know, would we be able to prevent this and, and stop this and, and maybe allow these cells to stay in this kind of less, less inflamed state um, for longer periods of time? Um, and so we've been thinking then about how um, infection itself could be the major contributor could be a major contributor to how these state changes occur within the immune cells within the brain. And, and what I've been studying as, as Tiffany um, uh, explained in the introduction is, is how we develop long-term immunity, how we develop memory to pathogens that we have seen and encountered before. And if you think about uh, the primary job of our immune system, uh, it has two fundamental jobs. One is to fight a present infection. And then I think it was Norm, who, who's, um, who's unfortunately feeling sick right now. Uh, you know, there that, that he's, his immune system right now is trying to get rid of that, that infection that he's, he's has, but then the second job that's really important is to allow us to prevent ourselves from getting sick again. Um, and how do we fight those future infections? And that is established in our immune system by the generation of what we refer to as memory cells, because they remember the pathogen that they saw originally. This is when you got your COVID vaccine, this is what you were trying to generate are these memory cells. And our memory cells can come in a few different types of cells. We have memory T cells, which is what I've been working on for my career, but there's also memory B cells and long-lived plasma cells. And these are the cells that are producing the antibodies that uh, will also circulate throughout your body and, and help to um, fight the, the pathogen should it come. So we call that our humoral defense. And then our T cells, we call those, um, uh, they because they operate more on a cell-to-cell -cell interaction basis, we call those our cellular defenses. And so generating these long-lived memory cells um, is, is an important part of is how we develop immunity. And so this is just a give you an example of, of how we would kind of characterize this over the course of, of, a, um, of an infection. You can see this is kind of the kinetics of how these immune cells or T cells and our B cells emerge. You can see that when you have um, an infection initiate, you, the, then the virus will start to replicate within the first few days. Usually a virus is cleared within you know, a week to two weeks. And as soon as that virus infects our body, 
we start to have activation of T cells that can recognize that virus very specifically. Uh, and those T cells will then um, start to rapidly expand. So I'm showing you here in kind of like a line graph, this is like numbers on the Y axis. And then this is kind of down here below is kind of more of a cartoon of, of what's happening. But we have small numbers of cells that recognize the virus. We refer to these as naive T cells if they haven't seen the virus yet. They, they're, they're, they're specific for the virus, but they haven't encountered it yet so they're called naive but once they see the virus and they get and the as when the virus infection begins then they become activated t cells and as they become activated t cells they start to to rapidly expand they start to divide and multiply their numbers and that's what we're seeing here and so one cell can then turn into two cells can turn into four cells can turn into eight cells can turn into 16 cells you can see they just exponentially start to grow we call that clonal expansion and then they start to uh, develop at the same time, they start to develop effector properties. So they start to develop the ability, all these viral fighting weapons, they start to produce as they expand, they start to develop into these effector T cells. And these effector T cells are really important for allowing the clearance of the pathogen, but this is also why you feel sick. So when you get sick, uh, and get a cold is the production of all of these effector molecules that our immune cells and our T cells and, and our macrophages are producing that is making us, us feel sick. Um, so this is what this is why you take ibuprofen or you know try to take um, a, a, a COX-2 inhibitor and NSAID when you um, are feeling sick to kind of tamper down the, the inflammatory products that are being produced by your by your immune cells. And so as these cells then uh, undergo uh, a, a, a productive clearance of the pathogen, you go through what we call the resolution or the contraction phase, where now all these activated T cells that were generated, they start to die. Many of them die. We try to recover, we try to return to a kind of a homeostatic baseline. And then we develop a small number of these cells, about five to 10% of them will actually seed a long lived pool of memory T cells. And so one of the biggest questions that my lab worked on for many years when, when, um, when I first started working on the, the question of how do memory T cells form was that we found that there's a small percent of these effector cells that actually have the capacity to give rise to this pool of memory cells. So it's not just random which, which cell goes into becoming a memory T cell, but it's actually selective. And some of these effector cells are in about five to 10% are endowed with the ability to develop into these memory T cells. And so we kind of understood then how we learned how this process of contraction happens and how this pool of memory T cells is seeded. But what's really important to know about these memory T cells is now these are the cells that are going to protect you long term. So you generate memory T cells, you generate memory B cells as well, the ones that circulate that produce the antibodies. And these are going to then circulate throughout our body and they can develop um, a memory in virtually every tissue. And they can develop into two main types of, of memory T cells. There are the memory T cells that circulate, we call them circulating memory T cells. So they circulate from your blood through your tissues and, and back through your blood again. And then there's ones that develop residents, long-term residents. We call them tissue resident memory T cells. And these are cells that go into your tissues and they kind of just stay there and they get lodged for lodged and they survive in your tissues for, for many, many years. Um, oh, yeah, I was just going to say that these effector cells, then if you come back to these two jobs, these effector cells are the cell, cells that fight the present infection, but then it's the generation of this long-lived memory pool that's there to fight the future infections. So, so as I just mentioned, there's these two types of memory T cells, the ones that circulate throughout your body and the ones that persist in tissues. And understanding these cells that the, these differences between these two memory T cells, especially these ones that persist in your tissues for long, long periods of time, what do they do? Where do they go? What do they do? Are they also, even though they're there to protect us, if, if you think about essentially what you're doing is you're filling up your body with, with memory T cells at all of your surfaces. So you have memory T cells that, that line your, um, that are um, in your skin, in the barrier, you know, of, of your skin, you have, you have memory T cells that 
go in and enter your intestine. And so they're there in the gut where your gut could get exposed to, to pathogens. They're there in your lung. When you breathe, they're, they're up, they're up in, let's see, where's the lung? I can't see. I'm trying to look at everything. This is in your lung. They're there in your lung, trying to, um, uh, right there again at the interface between the air and your, your lung tissue, you have memory T cells that are, are sitting inside these tissues. So essentially what we're doing is when we get an infection, we can, produce memory T cells that have the capacity to go to virtually all of the tissues in our body. And some circulate throughout our body, but then some stay lodged in within our tissues. They're at kind of the portal of entry for the pathogen so that they're the first line of defense uh, if you should encounter that pathogen again. And the lung is another tissue that we study a lot. But the brain is interesting in that it's not obviously a, a obvious barrier tissue. It's not exposed to the environment but we also develop memory T cells in the brain. And that was what, one thing that started to come apparent in the field. Um, and there's hardly anything known about these memory T cells in the brain. And that was what started to pique my interest as well in thinking about what these cells may be doing. And so this is a, a, a really nice study that came out from John Hardy's lab. He's at the University of Iowa. And this is all in mice, but we can also see in humans these memory T cells. But what he showed was that if he gave any, he was he gave many types of immunizations to the mice. He gave them infections, or he even gave them um, kind of like the flu shot, if you will, which is a, a, a killed virus vaccine that you know you inject into the muscle. And when he when he immunized the mice in all these different ways, he kept finding it, despite how he immunized them or what he infected them with they all develop memory T cells in the brain. And we thought that was kind of interesting. And that's what I'm just showing you here on this blue line. This is a way we call it IV negative because it's a way that we can track the cells that are in the, we can separate the cells that are in the blood shown here in red versus cells that are in the tissue using this technique that we refer to as intravital labeling. So that's what it's IV negative and IV positive. But these are the memory T cells in the brain. And so you can see that after the immunization, they persist for a very long period. So here he's looking out over a year in the brain, and you can see that these memory T cells exist, persisted in the brains of these animals. And that was, a, and again, it was kind of an interesting because it, no matter how he kind of immunized the animals, these memory T cells formed in the brain, these long lived memory T cells. And these are resident memory T cells. They're not circulating. They're not, they're not um, entering and going through the, through the blood. So, so they're sitting there in the brain for long periods of time. And so that made us start to think about, well, what could these memory T cells be doing? But I wanted to take you, walk you back up for a little bit and show you about there's not a lot known about T cells in the brain in general. That's 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 kind of where where we are. But I did want to tell you about some interesting studies that I think are quite related to what we know about T cells in the brain. And this was an interesting study. It gets back to this idea of this bystander inflammation that we've been talking about um, as potentially a, a, a element of uh, of a risk for Alzheimer's disease. And this, this study showed that if you just look at old mice, so they're not even um, doing anything to the mice, they're not infecting them, they're not, they're just looking at old mice. Um, here's young mice, that are like three to seven months, here's old mice, they're two, 20 to 24 months, about the average lifespan of a mouse is about two years. And they showed that if you looked at these old mice, you could see that there were more T cells. CD3 is just a, a marker that we can use to identify T cells. You could see there are more T cells in the brains of these old mice. And if they looked at where they where these uh, T cells were, they found them in a particular area um, of the brain um, called the subventricular zone. And in the subventricular zone, this is just showing you some images. You can see they're pretty, they're still pretty rare. You can see like these little white dots or these T cells. That's what they're showing you here. Um, they're still pretty rare, but when they looked at the subventricular zone in these old mice and they had mice that either did not have T cells or they had mice that did have T cells, um, they could see that all of this green shown here is, is a marker of interferon production. So it's, you can see that in these old mice that have T cells and these white cells again, are these T cells in this particular zone of the brain. You could see that there was an, a correlation, again, it's just a correlation, but there was a correlation that when there were T cells present, 
there was this um, inf there was interferon being produced as, as indicated by this green marker. And then these are the animals that did not have T cells and they, they, there's a way to, to generate animals, like kind of like the boy in the bubble, you know, a genetic deficiency, they don't have T cells. Um, they didn't have as much of this interferon marker. So what they went on to show in this, in this study was that these, this interferon in the, in this part of the brain was actually preventing and reducing the neurogenesis of, of, the, of the, of the, of new neurons. So the ability to regenerate and make new neurons in this particular part of the mouse brain was uh, reduced. And it was affected by the production of this interferon by that, by these local, that these local T cells were having. So, so in this paper though, they didn't, these, they didn't show that these were memory T cells. They didn't show, there was just, you know, there was, this was just the uh, accumulation that was seen in, in animals that were never exposed to pathogens or anything like that. This is just the kind of the age accumulation, uh, age related accumulation of, of T cells in the brain, but, but there was no, um, you know, there was no delivery of they, the animals were never exposed to a, to a pathogen or, or to a microbe in, in these particular studies. And then this is a more recent study that came out of, um, Tony Weiss Corey's lab, where they found uh, in looking in human cerebral spinal fluid, comparing people who had al Alzheimer's disease versus those that do not, healthy age match controls, they found an, an increase in CD8 T cells, this, this killer type of CD8 T cell. They found an increase in these CD8 T cells in the cerebral spinal fluid. And then when they looked in a couple of plaques, they didn't have a lar large number of of, there wasn't a lot of evidence to support this, but they had a couple of plaques that when they looked at a few of these plaques, they could see some T cells neighboring the plaques. And that's what's shown here in some of the Alzheimer's disease. So again, complete association, just a correlation that people who had Alzheimer's disease had more, had more CD8 T cells in their cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and when they looked at the plaques of a few individuals, they could find evidence of, of T cells nearby. And I should say that this, this association of T cells near plaques has been um, produced before by another group. But again, it's, it's, it's just small numbers. Of, there's not a lot of evidence to support this. There's, there's, there's just a small, a little bit of evidence out there, a few publications, and, you know, and, it's, and it's correlative. That's, that's all we know. Um, and then this was, again, another paper that uh, in mice showing a, very similarly that if you just look at the plaques of a mouse model that develops Alzheimer's disease, you could also see some correlation of T cells being adjacent to these. And then here the T cells are being labeled in red. And so you can see these T cells are, are kind of near some of the, some of the plaques. So, so there's this, again, this kind of like, you know, just correlative data that there might be some T cells sniffing around these plaques and, and sniffing around uh, parts of the brain that are associated with, with inflammation. And so, so that's kind of what we wanted to start to study is like, well, is, is there more to this than, than just this, um, this, uh, this correlation and what no one has been doing in, in these prior studies is actually infecting mice with pathogens and then studying the changes that occur with the brain, how this changes with age and, and what is happening long-term. Is there any evidence that having prior infections could lead to uh, these age-related changes and can contrib contribute more profoundly to these age-related changes that are occurring in the brain. And so that was what we wanted to start to do. So we, we asked, you know, are viral infections affecting this inflammatory state of the brain and, and can they have long lasting impacts and long lasting effects on the brain? And so we started to work with animals where we infect the animals and then we just study the brain. We look at what happens. We do different types of analyses to look at where, what changes are happening. And we're focusing on the T cells because we, we know that those can enter the brain and become these tissue resident memory cells. And then we're also studying the brain resident macrophage, these microglia, which are important sources of inflammation to ask what's happening to the inflammatory states of, of cells. And so this is some, um, some of our newer work. I have a student in the lab who uh, just who's on maternity leave right now. Um, but some of the data that she she uh, was able to obtain before her maternity leave um, uh, was just just fascinating because we're trying to do more imaging in the lab. We're trying to look at where these T cells are in the brain after infection. 
And so she's looking at two different parts in the brain. Um, these are what we call the border tissues of the brain. These are what are exposed to the cerebral spinal fluid of the brain. And the cerebral spinal fluid is actually generated within um, the um, choroid plexus, this area of the brain shown here in pink. And this is what makes the cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is the blue, the blue in here going, you know, and it cushions the brain and it flows through the brain. And the cerebral spinal fluid is what's thought to kind of help remove kind of the, the proteins and the accumulation and the products. It's kind of like the washing of the brain and, and, you know, how much cerebral spinal fluid flows through your brain at night when you're sleeping is, you know, it's an important part of, of what happens with, with sleep and helps to keep brain health. Um, but that's produced right here in your choroid plexus. And so we looked, and this is also with the choroid plexus has a has an intimate interaction with with the blood system. And so the circulation is 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 connected to to the to the choroid plexus. And so we look to see where are T cells in these different regions of the brain that are coming that have inner interactions with with the blood. Um, and what we found was that when we looked at where are the T cells after just one viral infection, uh, we found that they were in two different places. We found that they were predominantly in the choroid plexus shown here in these pink areas and in this, the blue area out here, the meninges that are the outer, outer, uh, edges of the, of the, of the, in the, the, in this, in the area that kind of surrounds the, the, um, the brain tissue in this, this, this area right here that's shown here. And so this is looking then at the choroid plexus, this, these pink, this pink area here. And what you can see here is this is what you see without an infection. So this is what most people are studying when they study mice where they've never been infected. Very few T cells are found in the choroid plexus of, of these animals. But if you look after just one single viral infection, and this is 40 days later, this is after the, the resolution, the contraction phase, this is just looking at the, the, the pool of memory T cells that exist following that infection. You can see all of these T cells shown here. So this is really a dramatic change in the, the composition of parts of our brain after, after an infection. And you can see on the next slide, we're now gonna, so this is, like I said, we were looking at the choroid plexus. Next slide, we're gonna go into this meninges part of the, the outer uh, layer of the brain. And again, this is an animal that's never been infected. This is, you can't really see the teeth. There's just a few T cells, but this is after an infection. So just a dramatic increase in T cells. And again, this is just resting. So we want to take these animals out longer and let them age and try to see, see what's happening to the brain. But we started to look at some of the functions of the T cells in the brain after this. And we can see that there's as we would expect, there's a greater number of T cells uh, in the brains of these animals. This is now counting them uh, using a different technique to count them. And if we look at their ability to produce cytokines, then be an inflammatory cell type, you can see that we can see that there's an increase then in the number of cells that can produce these inflammatory mediators that could lead to age-related inflammation. So, so the most important thing to take away from this is that after just even one infection, we're seeing this remodeling of the brain, both in terms of the types of immune cells that are present within the brain, and particularly within the choroid plexus and in the meninges. But then second, we are seeing that these cells now have, because they've been they've developed into these effector-like cells, they have this capacity to produce inflammatory mediators. So we also want to then look at the microglia and again, remember in a homeostatic state, the microglia are not inflamed, but if they become primed, they can become uh, these inflammatory like cells and can produce inflammatory mediators as well. And so when we started to look at the um, changes in the, after even just a single infection, look at the changes in the microglia, we could see that there was an increase in the, in the number of microglia within the brain after this infection. And we also saw an increase in other types of immune cells, another type of macrophage that comes in from the bone marrow. So there's infiltration of other immune cells in the brain after the infection. And then if we looked at some of the products of these cells that they can make, um, we could see evidence of having increased activity or reactivity, suggesting that these cells were kind of in more of a primed or inflamed state as these are markers of, of those kinds of states in the microglia. So there, there was even many days after the infection, this is looking like two months after the infection, we could see that there was still this long-term 
change that had occurred in the microglia. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you are probably thinking about long COVID and, and as that has become a big part of, of um, a lot of people are dealing with long COVID as a result of the pandemic. And, and of course, this, this type of um, uh, change in the brain uh, as it related to having SARS-CoV-2 infection is certainly contributing to, to long COVID. Um, so, so that was kind of the, the basis of what we wanted to try to understand. But what we, what everything I just showed you was a single infection. That was just one infection. Now we're not infected with just once, once in our life. We experience infections throughout our entire life. We experience multiple infections throughout our life. And so really the question I wanted to ask was, well, what, what happens then if you can serially infect these animals? What happens and how does serial infection change the, the biology of the brain and change the types of cells that are in the brain, change this age-related inflammatory state? And so we had a very simple hypothesis is, you know, do serial viral infections, will they hasten the onset and severity of age-related inflammation and neurodegeneration in animal models of AD? Um, and, and, try, and basically try to develop a more physiological model for studying Alzheimer's disease because to date, everyone is studying animals that have not actually been exposed to any type of infection. And as you can see, the results of, of um, having an infection can lead to um, a, a profound changes in, in the, the types of cells that are in the brain and, and the, the types of inflammatory molecules they can produce. So basically what we have been doing over the, over the last uh, uh, year and a half is, is starting to develop cohorts of mice for which we are serially infecting them with different types of pathogens. And so we're trying to infect the mice during the first year of their life. And, um, and, and we're working, and then we're infecting either control mice, wild type, what we call wild type mice, control mice, or we're infecting mice that are prone to developing Alzheimer's disease. And, and these, and these mice have um, genetic, um, uh, express genetic uh, changes in APP, and also presenilin-1, these, these proteins that have been shown to be genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease in humans. And these mice express these, these forms of these, these proteins and develop model and develop Alzheimer's-like pathology um, as, as they age. And usually within about nine to 12 months, we can start to see plaques in these, uh, in these AD-prone mice um, relative to, to the controls. And these mice will start to succumb and die um, as a consequence of, of their Alzheimer's disease pathology that's being generated in these animals over um, over anywhere between 15 and 20, 20 months of, of life, usually. Um, we can see these animals succumbing to this disease. But what we're trying to do then is say, okay, well, now if we start to infect these animals multiple times, um, what, what happens to the types of T cells in the brain? Does this hasten the, the age-related pathology? And um, what what um, what happens? And so we actually are just because we're aging these animals, or we're trying to age them over time. We we had our first cohort of mice that we were able to take down um, about a month and a half ago. And we're still analyzing that these data because um, our my as I mentioned, the person who's working on this went on maternity leave. So I have some of the earliest uh, data that we were getting out of this analysis. But what is is um, as we would expect, we've been infecting these animals. So there's there's four different groups of animals. Then we have the, the controls. I'll just go back to this because we have four different groups. So we have the animals that are controls. We have the animals that are prone to Alzheimer's disease. And, that, and these animals did not receive any infection. And then we have the other two groups of animals that receive the infection. So we have the controls and we have the AD prone mice and they receive four different infections. We're giving them, these infections are also, they're acute infections. They're not supposed to lead to long lasting chronic infection. And to our knowledge, they are not known to infect the brain per se. So we're not purposely trying to infect the brain. We're trying to affect the periphery of the animal um, and then look at what changes happen in the brain. But of course we could use other models to inf that would lead to infection of the brain. And then that could give us another different type of a model to study. But what we're just showing you here is a number of memory T cells within the brain of these animals. And as you can see, um, although the numbers of animals that we have right now are small, when we looked at the, 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 both the CD4 and the CD8 memory T cells that were forming in the brain, these kind of brain resident memory T cells, those are in green and turquoise, uh, you can see that there, there is an increase 
uh, pretty profoundly in the animals that got infected, which is good. We expect to see more memory T cells in the brains of the animals that got infected um, versus those that did not. So this is just your, your general age related increase in memory T cells, but these are the ones that are um, um, been exa exacerbated uh, and increased as a result of being infected. And then you've got the cells that are in the, in the blood. We can't really find too many in the blood in the brain. And then this is just showing you markers that we can use to distinguish these cells in the brain. We use proteins that can help us identify these brain resident memory T cells from the ones that are in the blood as well. Um, and so we can see that they're, they're increasing as a result of having gone, having the animal been ex, ex, uh, infected multiple times. But this is, got, this is where it got pretty interesting. And again, these are really early days. We don't know what we, we're going to, you know, if this is how reproducible this is going to be. But we started to look at the two areas of the brain that are most impacted by Alzheimer's disease, the, the, the cortex, the frontal cortex, and the, and the hippocampus. And this is showing you the hippocampus. And we got pretty excited by these data because I hope you can see in here, we're doing imaging. And what you can see in um, red are the blood or pink are the blood vessels. Uh, blue is, is, a, is a stain for the nucleus, the DNA of cells. And you can see that there's a, just a lot of cells in this compact region of, of the hippocampus. Um, and then in turquoise, again, are the T cells. And we're looking at both CD4 and CD8 cells at the same time. So they're both stained in this turquoise color. Um, and what you can see is that if you look at the wild type, the control animals that did not get infected, we can't see hardly any T cells anywhere around. These are then the animals that got infected four times. So again, they had this, this history of infection over the early phase of their life. They had four different infections. We can see a, a rare T cell here and there. So there is a little bit more of an increase in T cells, but very, very rare. And that's because, as I mentioned, these T cells aren't inside the parenchyma of the brain. They're in the choroid plexus, they're in the meninges, but now we're looking in, in the hippocampus. We're looking in like the middle of the brain. You know, can, can we see T cells there? And we don't really see them there. But then you look now at the animals that are developing a pathology and signs of Alzheimer's disease. These are the animals that did not get infected, but they have, they're developing pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So here you can see where some plaques are developing in the hippocampus. We can see that because of microglia, we can also stain for A beta, but we can also see that just based on changes in the, the way the microglia surround the plaques, you can see that the, these are where the plaques are. And you can see the microglia are in this activated kind of prime state as a result of surrounding the plaques. And you can see here, uh, there are a few T cells here and there, and I'll blow it up in just a second. You can see there's a few, there are some T cells around the plaques, and this is what's been reported in, in the literature before. But then this was really interesting. There, these are, this is in an animal now that had been infected multiple times. Um, we know it has more memory T cells in the, in the choroid plexus and the meninges, but here we're seeing a lot more T cells kind of in these aggregates also in the hippocampus that's shown you. So you can see here, and I'll blow it up on the next slide here. Again, you can see here's, here's the um, T cells shown here in turquoise, the yellow or the microglia. And you can see that there's just this, this kind of aggregate and this is just showing the blood vessels and the T cells is the same picture, just looking at two different things. You can see that this is now these kind of like T cell aggregates are, are being present in the hippocampus of these animals that have received multiple infections. And so just to go back to these four different groups, because it's it's quite striking, you know, if we if this reproduces, this is a quite striking result where we see no T cells in the hippocampus of the animals who didn't get infected. In the aged animals that did get infected, you know, there, again, there's just a couple of T cells that we can see in the parenchyma of the brain. But now in these animals that have Alzheimer's disease uh, pathology, but did not get infected, again, we can see a few T cells here around the neighboring these plaques. But now in the animals that had received multiple infections throughout their life and age and have a genetic a risk for Alzheimer's disease. Now we're seeing, um, a, a, you know, a much more apparent um, in, infiltration of T cells into the hippocampus of of this of this animal. So, so we're we're really interested. You now we're talking to the neuroscientists about this because we're trying to understand, you know, how do these T cells come in? 
um, what would be attracting them. And so that's really, you know, we've got a lot of work now to try to figure out what's happening in the in these regions that would be altered. Um, and then of course, how does this relate to synaptic health? And so starting to now do more studies on the, the quality of the synapses and the, and the types of cells um, that are present in there um, is where we're, we're going. And one of the um, major factors that we want to start to test is if it's interferon itself that's leading to the accumulation of T cells in the hippocampus. And so we're going to try to block certain um, uh, inflammatory molecules like interferons and try to see if that's changing uh, some of the, the accumulation of these T cells in the in the brain. Um, and also we want to try to get rid of the T cells themselves and see if that changes the pathology of the Alzheimer's disease progression in these in these animals. So that's so that's kind of where we're going. Um, I'm not sure exactly where I am for time, Tiffany. Would this be a good place to stop? Or because I did have a couple of other slides I wanted to show of something that I thought the folks might might enjoy listening to. Please feel free to go ahead. Okay. Um, but before I do, I want to thank the people um, that helped with us. I want to thank you most of all for, for your support and letting us start this type of work. This is These are long-term projects. Uh, they're very expensive projects because we're aging animals that have been infected. And that that in itself is, is a more expensive um, form of research to, to have to work with infected animals. Um, and then, of course, uh, we're, we're learning all of these, these interesting and new techniques. And we've been helped a lot by people at Salk, with, uh, including Rusty Gage um, and Nicola Allen, who's another uh, CART um, uh, uh, investigator, um, and, and other people at, at Salk as well, um, in, um, uh, who a project lead, Steffi Zambetti, and uh, the Stem Cell Corps has also helped us. But we couldn't have done this also without our collaborators um, at UCSD, who are part of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Consortium, and Doug Galasco is the director of that and has been very helpful for helping us try to get some human um, samples that I, I that is an ongoing project uh, in the lab as well. But I did want to just tell you um, a couple of, I thought, aspects of, of activities going on at Salk that you might be very interested in because, um, uh, as I mentioned, part of the way I got into studying Alzheimer's disease was because I became part of this um, larger team project that was funded by um, the Allen Institute and the American Heart Association. And so there's, this has brought together 10 investigators looking at um, different aspects of Alzheimer's. And one of the groups that is, is part of the team is um, John Reynolds, who's a, a neuroscientist and, and his staff scientist, Courtney Glavis Bloom. And we have a small marmoset colony at Salt that they're studying uh, aging in, and, 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 and particularly cognitive impairment. And so I thought I would just sh share with you a little bit of their data because it's uh, I think the marmoset is going to become a premier model for studying uh, aging. Marmosets, um, their their brain is is more similar to the the human brain. Obviously, um, they uh, also their lifespan is about. Um, 12 to 17 years in captivity. So that gives us, um, as a compared to other non-human primate studies that, of species that we use for studying aging, such as the rhesus macaque, which is, lives about 30 to 40 years. So their, their lifespan, given that they have a shorter lifespan in general, it makes them much more amenable to studying aging. And so what um, we're trying to do at the Salk Institute is um, to, you know, to better understand how marmosets age. And we're starting to um, monitor these animals over time. And I'm going to show you some of the cognitive testing that the, the uh, Reynolds and uh, the Reynolds lab is doing with the marmosets. And then we're serially sampling their blood to uh, over, over their lifespan to start to study changes in their um, immune cells. And then if upon the time that they um, uh, uh, cease to, to, to live, we're then also uh, taking their brains and other tissues and, and uh, doing analysis on that. And so I wanted to share, share with you some of the, the ongoing work that's coming out of the Reynolds lab um, to study the cognitive uh, um, abilities of these of this marmoset cohort that we have at, at Salk. And so the, they have given, it's really kind of cool, let me go ahead. They've, they, what they've done, I, I wish I had a video of this, but what they've done is they've put basically an iPad in the, uh, where, where the marmosets live. Now the marmosets uh, at Salk, they don't live in cages per se. They live in these habitats 
that are quite fun. Uh, they get to jump around, they get to move around, they, they're, they're at free will, um, they live in a social, uh, they, they live with their family uh, and as, as would normally occur in the wild. Um, and they, um, and they just, you know, they, they are in captivity, but they're not, they're not, I don't want you to get the impression that they're in cages. And so what, what the Reynolds lab did was they put iPads in their cages and, and let them play video games, basically, uh, at will, as long as they want all day. And they get a little reward if they do, if they play the video game right. And this video game is a, is a memory game. It's, a, it's asking them how much they remember. And they get a little bit of apple juice. They, the marmosets love marshmallows. Uh, they're, they're these sugar hounds. They love sweet things. And so, so apple juices are a reward if they do this right. And so this is called the delayed recognition span task. And it measures um, memory in the prefrontal cortex, which is an area of Alzheimer's disease that um, is, is affected. Um, and so basically what happens is the animal has to know that a new object has emerged on the screen. And so it's the test. So they, they hit the blue button to start the game an object will appear. They know that if they touch the object, they'll get a little bit of apple juice and then uh, the, there'll be a delay. And then that object stays, but a new object emerges and they get apple juice. They get a reward if they touch the new object. So if they touch this again, they won't get the reward, but when they touch this, they will. Then they get a delay, a third object comes up. And if they touch the new object, they get the reward. And so it goes on and on until they can't tell if there's a new object and they make a mistake. Um, and so that's kind of the, the way that it, this memory uh, task works. And so this is now the learning curve of, um, I forget how many they've done, but it looks like over like 20 different marmosets. This is a learning curve and, and, and this is their age in years. So the red, the red lines, the warmer colors are the older marmosets. And they've been doing this now for almost two years, a little, maybe oh, actually almost three years now. Um, and this is the number of times they've played the game. So you can see that they can play it whenever they want in the cages and or in the in their homes and and they have you know unlimited access to the game and so some of them have you know done it over you know ten thousand times now and what they um, and you can see then the rate of learning that's what this is basically asking how many times they go until they fail make an error. Um, so that how many their accuracy basically over the number of times. So most of them can get up to four or five objects, new objects, but but then after that they start to make errors. And so this is kind of the rate of learning to get to that kind of peak performance of this task. Um, and you can see that there is variation and some are really fast learners and they happen to be a little bit younger. So that's kind of interesting. And then these are um, the average, the average length of time of learning. And then we have this one. We have this one marmoset that really is not learning very well. Um, and, and so anyways, I don't want to go on to too much detail, but I just want to let you know that we're doing this because what the um, uh, Reynolds lab has then been doing is um, asking, and this is just kind of over their cohort, there is definitely um, age-related loss of, of learning. So there's slower learning in the older animals um, and their overall performance decreases with time. So we do have an aging model of cognition uh, that we can now study in these marmosets. And, and, then, and they had to actually because of uh, the animals got sick, they had that's these lines end here because they had to um, take these animals down. A couple of animals got sick and they had to, to euthanize the animals. And so when they did this, they were able to then compare the brains of these animals. So this animal here, that's they're referring to as aging impaired because it never really learned. And this animal here, it learned quite well. It was the same age. These were relatively similar in age and they were able to then they had to sacrifice both of these animals. And so they were able to um, uh, study their brains. And basically what um, they found is that if you look at uh, synapses, this is, this is prior work that people have done. If you look at synapses on the neurons from young to old, there's a notable decline in the number of synapses in aged neurons. And so this is, we, we know this happens with age. We don't know exactly why, but we know this happens with age. And so they started to look then at these two marmosets that they were able to take the brains from. Again, the one that had no, no learning, the aged impaired and the aging unimpaired. And they started to serially 
um, examine using electron microscopy, the shapes of the neurons and the numbers of neurons. And they can look at all of these um, synaptic interactions within the brain of these animals using this microscopy technique. And they can look at it here at this actual synapse, the, what they call the synaptic bouton. And what they found is that there actually was no difference in the number of neurons between these two animals. So this is the aging impaired. This is the one that never learned. This is the one that did learn. There's no difference in the numbers of, of synapses uh, in these age. They were definitely decreased compared to the young uh, marmoset that they, they also had to um, euthanize due to illness. Uh, there was definitely a decrease in the synapses as would be expected, but there's no difference between these two, the one that couldn't learn, the one that could learn. But what they did find was that the synaptic shape is actually different and the one that could not learn. And so this, I think I have it on the next slide, this, 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 the size of this interaction here is actually bigger on the one that could not learn. And that sounds kind of counterintuitive, but they're they're trying to understand more about how this shape uh, might be associated with this, this inability of this animal to, to have to have cognitive um, uh, impairments as a result of um of, of these changes in, in neuronal uh in, in interactions between between the synapses. And so, so again, I just want to uh, tell you about this work because I think it's going to be a, a phenomenal model for studying um, uh, uh, Alzheimer's-like uh, and neurodegenerative diseases uh, and, and uh, many different aspects of aging. I think the marmoset is going to become a premier model for, for studying this. Um, and, and at Salk, you know, we're trying to invest in this, in this, um, uh, this new model because, because it's, um, going to be, I think, so informative for, for telling us what happens with age. And it's, and, and, and while marmosets don't naturally get Alzheimer's disease, they do get tau tangles. So they have other pathologies that just naturally arise with age, um, that, and people are trying to make now genetic models of marmosets that also can, um, have more, um, are more prone to developing Alzheimer's disease like pathologies. So there's going to be new innovations in this model as well that will help. But again, um, just want to thank you for um, for your um, attention and happy to to talk, uh, answer any questions. Relating to the T cells, if I understood correctly, the T cells are a memory cell uh, of an uh, a previous infection. Is that, is that correct? Yep. Yeah, the memory T cells are. Okay. So you have you have the T cells that haven't been activated yet. So you have T cells in your body that have never seen a pathogen and they probably never will. And we refer to those as naive T cells. They have the capacity <laughs> to see something, but they haven't been, uh, you haven't been infected with something that they recognize. Um, and so those are called naive T cells, but once they become activated, if they did see the virus that they recognize, once they become activated, then they can develop into these effector and then into these memory cells. All right. Now, how do we know that when the T cells, how do we know they work? Let's say that we got the infection twice. Yep. How, how would we know that the T cells work? So, so they protect, so usually what they do is they protect you from the more severe disease, as we've learned a lot about what, you know, the intent and purpose of, of immunity is, is to protect you from more severe disease. So we know they work because usually the second time you were to be exposed to the pathogen, the illness is much more mild. It's much more oh. shorter lived. Okay, um, and that's a and that's a result of the collaboration of both these memory T cells and memory B cells, right? So the circulating antibodies are also quite important. But as we've learned through COVID, if the pathogen changes, and now the antibodies no longer are able to recognize and prevent that that virus from infecting, you still have your memory T cells though that recognize other parts of the of the virus. And that's why these vaccines are still working very well, even though Omicron has, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 has changed and has evaded the antibody to the vaccines that we, we were originally given. Um, our memory T cells are still present and they recognize lots of other parts of the virus. And so that, that's why you're, you're seeing this improvement in the, you know, the severity of disease as a result of having this 
your, your body has these memory T cells and B cells in it that can react to the, the virus a second time. All right. Thank you. Yeah. We want to say a very special thank you to Dr. Keck, because not only was this an incredible presentation, but you guys, she is like in Hawaii right now on a totally <laughs> different time zone than we are. And she got up extra early today to spend some time with us. And we are so grateful and so appreciative. We do want to remind folks that if you will subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will be notified when new videos are added. And we are constantly adding not only recordings of lunch a la carte, but also um, some training sessions and some spotlights of fundraising ideas. And we have much more of those to come as well.